There's a few things I'd like to say before we start the questions, and one is that uh, Seattle University does not support or oppose the position of the speakers. The views expressed are those of the speakers only. The Institute of Public Service is sponsoring this event along with Seattle University and, of course, the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, another thing I'd like to mention is if you didn't see the book stand out there, uh, this is a wonderful book. Both Joni and I have read it. Uh, everything Trump touches dies, so uh, you know, please pick up a copy. Um, I guess we'll just start with the questions. We'll just start with the questions. Oh, wait, there's one thing I was going to mention, and that is the next uh, uh, conversation in our series is going to occur on February 28th, and it's going to be on the issue of corporate social responsibility. And we're fortunate enough to have the uh, president of Microsoft, Brad Smith, will be here. And we hope to, hope to also have somebody from another major corporation here in Seattle. So please put that on your calendar, February 28th. You'll be here in this auditorium. OK, thank you all so much for coming. Really appreciate it. Uh, we'll start with you, Governor Locke. Just the big, broad question here. What are, you, what are you thinking about the coming midterms? Wave, no wave, regular midterm. And as you know, um, in midterms, frequently the party opposing the president usually does pick up a couple seats. But what, what do you think we're looking at? Well, I think that uh, there will be substantial gains by the Democrats in the House, at least. I don't know that uh, people are expecting any change uh, in the absolute control of the Senate. Um, but I don't... Uh, you know, I, I've always believed that politics is very, very local, and, and while a lot of the forecasters are going district by district, race by race, and, and handicapping it, uh, there's, they're all within the margin of error in many of those races. And so I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm always fearful of predicting, uh, making broad, broad predictions and saying one party will either control the House or regain control of the House, et cetera, et cetera. So we're just going to have to wait and see. Uh, there are a lot of races here in the state of Washington that are very, very competitive and conflicting polls. And uh, I've always been wary and leery of polls. And so I guess as a politician, I've always just tried to keep battling and campaigning to the very, very end and never letting up. Rick, we'll, we'll go to you. You have to do this, what, on CNN, MSNBC, and just every day sort of come up with what you think, what the numbers will look like. Do you, what do you think? Big wave? Well, I think one thing we have to realize right away is that the Senate landscape this year was always favorable for the GOP. There were only eight seats up for the GOP to defend, and the Democrats were having the bad year. So the fact that they're competitive in a few of these places that Republicans thought they were going to take, um, like West Virginia, the fact that they're competitive in Texas, which is astounding. I mean, they, Beto O'Rourke may not win, but the fact that he's in the fight at all in the state of Texas, it's Texas, um, should tell you a lot about where the, where the political map looks like. You know, you've got a couple of places the Democrats could pick up. North Dakota is one, one of the reddest of the red states. Um, in Florida, it looked for a while like Governor Scott was gonna be able to, to, to be very competitive in the race. He and Bill Nelson are tied, even though Rick Scott is spending money like a drunken sailor on shore leave. Um, but the, the Senate landscape is, it was always gonna be at least a net neutral for the GOP with a possibility of one, possibly two pickups. Right now, I think they're probably gonna end up as, at plus one at best, but a lot of the Senate seats are contingent on one thing, and that's Donald Trump's Twitter feed. These are close races, and if Donald Trump wakes up one morning on the wrong side of the bed and decides to nuke Belgium, or, or, uh, you know, uh, or accuse Hillary Clinton of being a cannibal. You know, the, the landscape may change a little bit between, between those two moments. Now, if you're looking at a situation in the House, the numbers in the House, there's one magic number, that's 24. You get to 24, Nancy Pelosi's speaker. And you get to 24, and Devin Nunez and Dana Rohrabacher and Jim Jordan and all this crew of jackasses who've been a one-party uh, you know, one obstruction of justice effort uh, to, to block the Mueller investigation and to stop any probes of the corruption in the Trump administration. If you end up in that situation, well, guess what? The whole chemistry of Washington changes. They need one seat in the majority to do it. I think the Democrats are probably going to end up somewhere in the 30 to 37 range, just with some math I've done on the numbers. And again, a lot of this comes down to what happens on Election Day 15 days from now and what happens every day between now and then, because every day is Election Day. There's early voting going on in 44 states as of right now. 
So that early voting process is going to be something that every day, you know, Donald Trump is tweeting about the uh, the migrant horde of the caravan approaching to you know to, to 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 steal your jobs and rape your women and eat your dog, and and you know those things are going to affect voter turnout every day. This thing going to affect the electoral chemistry every day. I think the Democrats have a very very good chance of taking back the House, um, and I think that 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 number is probably going to be somewhere in the mid to high 30s. And I do want to emphasize there are still two weeks to go before the election, so anything can happen. Absolutely. Anything can happen. It could be local, it could be national, it could be international. Well, Rick, we got a question for you. All right. You're a self-acknowledged conservative, but you seem to be a man without a party now. I mean, who do you want to win in this uh, midterm election? I want people to win who will do their damn jobs. I want people to who I want the people I want to see in office are the ones who act like the Congress is a co-equal branch of government and not like a bunch of junior managers at a Trump casino sucking up to the boss. <laughs> I may not have a great deal of love for Nancy Pelosi, her politics, or her policies, but I know one thing. She's not going to wake up every morning and go, may I shine your shoes, Mr. Trump? Which appears to be the modus operandi of pretty much everyone in the Republican leadership right now. Um. So what do you mean, what do you think, and this is a possibility, the New York Times had an interesting piece yesterday. It is possible, Governor Locke, that the Republicans could retain control of everything. What message would that send? What would that say about where we are? Well, I really think that would be disastrous for our country, and I guess it's really, it would be disastrous for the future in terms of our standing in the world and what we're saying to the people of America I think there was a, a, a Rick, who was it that it was, wrote the column in the New York Times this uh, morning? Nick Kristoff. Nick Kristoff, who really argued on behalf of a strong Republican Party. And, and having served in Olympia and having worked with Republicans, I do believe that we need a strong two-party system or even a multi-party system in which ideas on, on both sides are constantly challenged. And when you have that challenge of ideas and debate, um, you're able to come up with better policy. Uh, neither party uh, has a monopoly on all the great ideas or the different perspectives uh, that, that reflect the, the, the views of the population. And so I, I really want a strong Republican Party. Of course, as a Democrat, I want the Democrats to prevail. But at the same time, I don't like what's happening in terms of the lack of leadership from the Republicans to stand up for what is right what is, in terms of our American values, in terms of morality, in terms of jurisprudence, thoughtful judges, uh, in terms of international leadership, I think that we're really being damaged by everything that's happening and we need someone to stand up and more people like John McCain and others to stand up to really call out the truth. And, and just as I would expect Democrats to call out the truth if there was a Democratic administration. I'm gonna call you ambassador for one minute here because um, that's one of your other titles. You, you do know something about our actual standing in the world, and you travel a lot. What have you heard that sort of made you, you know, from another country, perhaps in China or something, where made you so worried about this issue of our standing in the world? Well, I, I've sensed from the entire Asia Pacific that many of our traditional allies are gravitating and forming alliances and trade agreements uh, and uh, other treaties with China. And they don't feel that the United States has their back anymore. I mean, they don't want the United States meddling in their affairs, but they always kind of like the assurance or the reassurance that American forces, American power, American interest, the American government was just over the horizon, just, just over the horizon, and th that America could be called on to protect them and to help them. But now they don't really see that anymore, and so they're feeling that they're having to uh, form agreements uh, with China. Uh, not that they really want to, but out of necessity. And I see that happening all around the world. Uh, under the Trump administration, the budgets for the State Department for aid uh, have been cut drastically. Uh, and now the president has proposed beefing up some new corporation, a new initiative. But it pales in comparison to the, all the cuts that have made to the, been made to the State Department in terms of soft diplomacy. There was a time in which America went around helping people, helping farmers of other countries, building hospitals and roads, helping eradicate disease and bringing sanitation. That created so much goodwill for America. 
which then made it easier for the generals and our military to, uh, to try to form alliances. Um, and that's why you have so many people in the military, top military officials, calling for more funding in the soft power portions of the State Department. You just cannot rely on guns. Rick, you've already commented on the, uh, a few of the elections, but I'd like to probe a few more that are sure. of interest to our audience, I'm sure. The Texas race? Look, uh, as I said earlier, I think Beto O'Rourke is an absolutely remarkable candidate. I'm just going to say one word, though, and that word is Texas. <laughs> you got to keep this in perspective. I know everybody's very enthusiastic about him, and he is a remarkable candidate. He would not be in the hunt if he wasn't a remarkable candidate. And, and there's a lot of enthusiasm to turn Beto into the next Obama. I get that enthusiasm. I understand it. He has poise, he has confidence, he has charisma, he's quick on his feet, but it's also Texas. And I want you to just recall one thing about Texas. They love guns. <laughs> they love guns a lot. They love guns so much that, that y'all in Washington don't get it. I, and I tell Democrats <laughs> this a lot. I love y'all, but I tell you this a lot. The miscue socially on guns, no matter what you think about gun control policy, when you go to a state like Texas or Alabama or Florida or Georgia or North Carolina or South Carolina, oh wait, about 45 states, um, and Republicans hear you say, we want to do some gun control, they shut off, they stop listening. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is not relevant. It's the political behavior. So when Beto O'Rourke comes out and goes, I want to ban AR-15s and semi-automatic weapons, 70% of Texans go, nope. So he would probably be ahead of Ted Cruz right now if he just managed to keep his mouth shut. Now, will he still, will, will he win? It's almost certain that Ted Cruz will be a US Senator and he will grace us with his handsome figure, <laughs> his smoldering sexual chemistry, <laughs> and his charming rhetoric for the next six years. But Beto O'Rourke is the kind of candidate the Democrats need. They need people who are alive and kicking and engaging and smart and willing to talk to people. And I will give the guy credit for one thing and over almost anything else. The guy has hustle. You know, there, there was a, uh, there was, for the early voting in Texas this week, Beto O'Rourke was out at four in the morning this morning, sitting in a tent deck that, that some fan of his had decorated with Beto O'Rourke stickers outside an early voting place. And the guy went out and did a Facebook Live. He went out and talked to people. He's knocked on doors, he's gone everywhere, including the reddest parts of Texas to go and pitch. That sort of thing is where Democrats have fallen down for years and years, where they don't go to places they think they're, they, they don't go to places they think they're not gonna win. Oh my God, Will. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't agree with Donald Trump on a lot, but Hillary Clinton could have got off her ass and gone to Wisconsin a couple times. They took it for granted. When you take things for granted in politics, they get taken away from you. So Beto work is a huge work ethic. He's got a great future. I don't know if he's gonna, you know, fall behind Ted Cruz by two points or three points um, or, or 10 points. But that's, a, that's the kind of candidate Repub or the Republicans should be afraid of, even in red states. Okay, how about the Arizona seat, the open seat that John McCain vacated? Cinema, the Democrat, and uh, McSally, the Republican. Cinema has a tremendous amount of charisma. McSally has a tremendous, um, McSally has a tremendous uh, background, a tremendous narrative, a tremendous story of service. She hurt herself by getting a little too far in the, into the Trump bed during the primary. But cinema also has had some foot and mouth scenarios. So that's a tie ball game right now. Um, I think you're going to end up with my gut in that race tells me that cinema is going to squeak it out. Um, but I don't think it's going to be easy until the very end. And I think Mick Sally could end up with blowback on Trump with Hispanics in the state uh, very easily that we haven't quite mapped yet in, the, in terms of the, t the turnout model. And, and just one more is uh, Heidi Heitkamp dead in North Dakota? Heidi Heitkamp is uh, dead and the vultures are circling if the public polling is to be believed. I think she's kind of checked out. I mean, we're looking at double digits. And again, why are you surprised by this? It's a bad year for the Democrats in one of the reddest states. Donald Trump won the state by something like 9,000%. So. <laughs> That's the low end, low end number. <laughs> Governor Locke, everybody's been trying to predict all these recent weeks the impact of the Kavanaugh hearings. Supposedly, Women voters, suburban women voters are really riled up. No, that's not it. It's the men who are riled up. If you had to guess which those hearings, what impact they bring to the races in Washington state and nationally, 
What would you say? Who's, who's more motivated? I saw the Cook Political Report, folks. That's the Bible on some of this stuff. This morning they had a tweet about the year of the fired up female college graduate. Well, I think that um, the women are more fired up uh, in, in favor of the Democrats. So I think that uh, that'll benefit the Democrats. Um, the question, though, is, is will they, being fired up is one thing, will they actually go out and vote? Um, and I, we're seeing a lot more participation by women in terms of canvassing, and the Democrats have really done a great, great job getting people registered, canvassing door to door, and sending people out, uh, and especially after the, uh, the Kavanaugh hearings. Um, but whether or not the individual, it, it all comes down finally to the individual candidate and whether or not side by side, you know, does the Democratic candidate still outweigh um, all the, 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 the negatives and, and the Trump factor in those particular races? You, you look like yeah. you've, you've seen some data or I, something. I've seen some data, and <laughs> one of the reasons that the Republican Party's polling keeps showing 90% approval for Donald Trump is because educated women have largely said, check ya, they're out, they're done. You know, they, they sort of got a trial separation in November 2016, and since then the divorce has turned ugly, there are restraining orders, it's like War of the Roses, cuckoo <laughs> pants. So uh, I think women voters are very much less likely um, uh, on the Republican side to be there this fall. Uh, Democratic women we've seen in all the special elections of 2017 and 2018 um, will crawl over broken glass to vote against anyone who e has even acknowledged that Donald Trump is a sapient human being. So. <laughs> I think you're going to end up with an awful lot, an awful lot of, of, of turnout in the suburbs. I mean, one of the things we studied very closely was Ed Gillespie's race in Virginia. Ed is an old friend. He's a moderate Republican of every kind. He's the perfect fit for Virginia on paper. Well, in Northern Virginia, Republican women decided that they hated Donald Trump so much that they were just going to go ahead and stay home. So I think we may see that replicated out in ways that we haven't predicted yet. Uh, Governor Locke, um, we have a hotly contested race in the 8th District between Kim Schreier and Dino Rossi. It's attracted the second highest spending for a House race in the country. Where do you think it's going to come out? Well, various polls show that either Dino Rossi is leading or it's uh, a, um, virtually a, a dead heat. So um, that's why I say anything can happen in the next two weeks. Um, I think... Um, uh, well, I have my own personal views on that particular race. I'm not a fan of Dino Rossi having worked with him uh, in Olympia. Um, and, uh, Is there anything specific you wanted to... Well, he's, first of all, he's been going, uh, doing a lot of commercials saying he's taking credit for this no-tax increase budget and protecting vulnerable children and adults, et cetera, et cetera. Um, actually... Um, um, when he unveiled that budget, uh, and it was a tough budget, it was a, a budget that I actually unveiled several months earlier, and when he unveiled it, he basically had a presentation that says, following the governor's lead. And he, he had several tweaks to our proposed budget, but he had several draconian tweaks buried in that budget, one of which was cutting off 41,000, 40, over 40,000 children of working families from medical assistance uh, under the so-called S-CHIP program, which is very, very popular among both Democrats and Republicans in the United States Congress. And why he would do that, I have absolutely no idea. He also made cuts in nursing home uh, that affected um, middle-income families, people who are, not, who are privately paid patients. And so their nursing home rates had to go up under his budget proposal. And so, I mean, there were some tough choices in there, but uh, for him to say it was a, a budget that was, uh, you know, that he came up with, number one, uh, because he was kind of, uh, it was a tough budget, and so he hid behind us and said it was, I'm just following the governor's lead. And then now he's claiming that it was um, a very, very, um, uh, but, he, but he's ignoring the, his tweaks that were very, very draconian. And uh, there were other parts in, the, in, the, in that budget proposal that he came out with that really showed that he wanted to eliminate health care for children, families with children, and that was very, very distressing. Um, I'm supposed to hold up the book here. <laughs> this book you mean the number one New York Times bestseller? It's the uh, number one New York Times. So in this book, let, let, let me let me go back to 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 um, to uh, the the Schreier uh, uh, Rossi race. Um, if we're concerned about, and and uh, for instance, the Seattle Times came out with an endorsement of Rossi in the last few days, and said that they very much 
feel that Trump needs to be stopped and there needs to be a check on, on his policies and his, and his programs and, and what he stands for, and yet they endorse a Republican candidate that I don't really think is all that great, um, but they feel that on balance he's gonna be more pragmatic and, and more bipartisan. Well, if you look at Crystal's um, uh, commentary and, and column in the New York Times today, in which many conservative Republicans, including George Will, say that the only way that we can bring the Republican Party back to being a true opposition party and having values, you have to tear it all down and you cannot allow Trump to prevail in the United States Congress. So electing more Republicans to the Congress is actually emboldening Trump. And, and so um, that's why I think it's all the more important that we, if we have decent Democratic candidates, and Kim Schreier is a fantastic candidate uh, with her background as a pediatrician, then we need to have the Seattle Times should have been endorsing her uh, for that position instead of uh, Dino Rossi. So I wanted to ask you, Rick, um, so as I said, um, you're a pretty tough critic of the president. How much do you think Donald Trump is at play in this eighth district that we have here, one of the hottest races in the whole country? There's another race in eastern Washington uh, between Kathy McMorris Rogers and Lisa Brown and then in the third district in southwest Washington uh, near Vancouver, including see, Vancouver. See, see those 435 say. districts up there? Yeah. Donald Trump is on the ballot in every single one. That's my question. Donald Trump is a, th this is in large measure, a referendum on Donald Trump and Trumpism and Trumpist nationalism and his flirtation with authoritarianism and his flirtation with white supremacy. And, and that is one of the reasons why in an ordinary climate, Let's just hypothesize, let's do, a, do, do a, a, a counterfactual for a moment. And it's President Jeb Bush right now. Y'all might not have liked that. But if it was President Jeb Bush and the economy was doing what the economy's doing, the Republicans would gain seats in the House. Right now they are fighting for their lives in 70 of those districts, of which who knows which 35 are gonna be the, the are gonna you know, spin the right chamber when they're playing Trumpian roulette. Um, but he's on the ballot everywhere, and Republicans have made this fundamental decision that we can run elections that are based only on turning out the GOP base. And Democrats do this in a lot of places too. So you end up appealing to the edge cases of your party and not looking inward and not trying to reach into people who aren't activated partisan voters all the time. And the problem with Trumpism is it's not really an ideology, it's more of an affect. It's more about, can I be the biggest, loudest jackass in the room? Can I be the guy who pones the libs every day and who, who bases my campaign not on jobs, economics, healthcare, education, public safety, but instead on this whole menu of varying uh, you know, racially coded and socially coded anxieties and angers. So I think that's why Republicans are having such a steep hill to climb this year. Governor Locke, I want to talk about millennial voters. Um, I've seen a whole bunch of different numbers, so forgive me if these numbers aren't perfect, but I read somewhere that turnout for these midterms could be as high as 28% among, among millennials. Uh, and that's supposedly a big deal because in 2014, the last midterms, the turnout was something like 23%. What is your take on on this group of voters. Do you think it is going to be any different this time? Will they actually vote? And what, what could be done to bring in these voters who are sometimes called you know, a little bit disaffected? Well, I'm, I think the turnout will be high among the millennials and the younger generation. Um, uh, what excites them, what captivates them, I think a lot of it deals with social justice issues, income inequality, climate change, and, and all the things that really, that many people are worried about, but quite frankly, not many, of the, not many politicians on either side of the party are really addressing. Uh, that's why I think that Bernie Sanders was, was so attractive. Um, and that's why Trump and, and the very conservatives were, have been able to attract, well, candidates on the very right, including Trump, have been able to attract followers because they don't feel that either party is really addressing a lot of their core issues. And, you know, and, and Rick was talking about you know, the, the, the Republicans trying to appeal to their base. Democrat, uh, elections are won and lost in the middle. They're won and lost in the middle. 
And the candidate that can really capture and resonate with the deep-seated concerns, worries, anxieties, fears, frustrations um, of, of the voters will win. And the one who can almost give them hope will win. Now, you, know, you can have demagogues like Trump that promise everything, and, and none of those promises will come true, but at least he's articulating issues and promising things on issues that the middle is concerned about. And, and that's why I really felt that he won, especially in those battleground states, traditional blue-collar states like Michigan and Pennsylvania and, and, um, uh, uh, and other places. And so um, I really think that millennials also have some of these concerns. They may not be some of the core middle issues that their parents are concerned about, but they are concerned about the future of our planet. They're very concerned about social justice and income in, and growing income inequality, police brutality, and the and, and the list goes on and on. Rick, I'd like to ask you a question about turnout. Generally, in presidential elections, we have about 60% of eligible voters who turn out, and in midterm elections, is about 40% keep on hearing stories about a lot of early voting. Do you think it's gonna be different this year in terms of uh, turnout? I think we've seen in some of the early voting stuff that's come out in North Carolina, in Florida, uh, and in Texas as of today, that the early voting, uh, you know, it used to be that Republicans turned their people out with absentee ballots and early voting. And Democrats showed up on election day because they were organized into the field operation stuff. Well, it looks like the Democrats have finally gotten off their tails and figured out how to do early voting and AB vote and absentee ballot voting in a lot of these places. So in Florida, for instance, Democratic absentee ballot and early voting numbers are up about 14% over 2014, which should make Republicans take a moment and go, hmm. But I do think you're gonna see the, the, the fact that there's early voting and that every day is election day between now and, and the actual day. Um, you're gonna see the importance of early voting and, and motivating your base every single day and doing the operational things. I, I say this to Democrats a lot, that Democrats are great at certain things in politics, but they're holistically bad at politics. And Republicans are mediocre, but we're really good at all being mediocre across a whole bunch of different areas. Um, so the fact that you know, Democrats are learning how to turn out voters, finally, beforehand, uh, and locking and banking votes, as we call it, uh, is, is relevant, and I do think this is a year where both parties, Democrats with a slight advantage in the latest CNN poll and the latest Pew poll in terms of enthusiasm and interest in the election, it's, it's higher. Um, and I do think a lot of the Trump vote that came out for the first time ever in 2016, they are interested in Trump. They are part of the spectacle of Trump. I don't necessarily think that means that the guy with the red MAGA hat who showed up at the rally and voted because he wanted to get, make sure that the Kenyan Muslim was not replaced by the satanic devil worshiper Hillary. Um, I don't think that guy necessarily gets out and says, hmm, I'd better cast my vote for Dino Rossi because he will help, you know. I, I don't think that logic flows as naturally as, as the Republican uh, National Congressional, uh, the, the NRCC would like. Rick, Republicans seem to be, you know, today especially, zooming in on um, immigration and the caravan from Honduras. Well, Democrats are pretty heavily focused on health care. You see that in a lot of the ads. What do you think of these strategies for each party? I hate saying this in some ways because the Democrats for once are doing the right thing. And I've lectured them about being bad at politics so many times that when they do the right thing, I'm sort of astounded. Um, staying focused on health care, especially pre-existing conditions, it's always been the killer app of Obamacare. It's always been the thing. And we sat in focus groups in 2009 before the, during the Obamacare fight. I was working for a couple of interest groups with some brothers who you may know. Um, <laughs> and we were studying Obamacare and how to stop it. And in every one of these focus groups we'd sit in, we'd get the data back. And the one thing that would absolutely end the argument in favor of Obamacare was pre-existing. It did not matter. Republican, Democrat, black, it's because white. everybody knows somebody yeah, that has exactly a pre-existing, right? Exactly right, yeah, It didn't matter. Everybody had a cousin, a brother, a mom, a dad, a sister. Someone in their life had been screwed by an insurance company. And we wrote our reports up and said, if they get this to be the subject, you will lose. 
Well, so what did Republicans do when Donald Trump took office and their great, brilliant scheme to repeal Obamacare came out? Front and center, right, first day, we're going to get rid of this pre-existing condition coverage because, by God, that'll be popular with our friends in the insurance industry. Oh, and everyone in America hates it. You know why Republicans haven't done a town hall meeting? Why, you're, why Republican congressmen haven't done a town hall meeting since the spring of 2017? Because they got their tails handed to them over and over again. They got beat like rented mules by people who came up and stood at the microphone and said, hey, my daughter has cancer. What are you doing about it? Oh, you're taking away her coverage. Great, thanks. So the Democrats focusing on this right now is absolutely spot on. Now, what does the caravan do? The caravan. You know, and the president, by the time they get up to the border, it's going to be all of bin Laden's family are trying to sneak over the border. <laughs> that caravan story is, is fodder for the Fox News audience. That's what they want to be. That's what they want the, the, the red hat Yahoo crowd focused on because they took our jobs and they're coming to kill us. And I'm, I've, I've sent a couple notes this afternoon to some producers at, the, at CNN and MSNBC saying, you, know, you guys are playing Trump's game right now. You're playing their game by, by, by showing this and saying, this army of the poor is coming. These people in Trump's base want that. They want, they want to feel threatened. They're so, they, they feel so socially inferior that they always look for somebody else to, to, to urinate down on. Um, and it's, it's, it's a terrible commentary on what a, what a part of the base of my party and it's, it's infuriating because I know a, a, an awful lot of people who are smarter than this, and they love this crack. They love this game. What do you so think that, about so, this? So I think that that'll, that'll help mobilize the Republican base or some of the core uh, Trump supporters, and Trump will just keep uh, talking about the caravan and saying this is why he needs that wall, which is why we need to kick out uh, illegals, and it justifies all the principles and all the policies that he's been putting in place. This is... A visual image, a visual image of everything that he says he is trying to do for the American people. Is this the October surprise? Or in That's some I say, way? you know, anything can happen between now and, and now and, and election day. And, and as Rick was saying, depends on when they get to the border. Governor, like I'd like you to put on your uh, ambassadorial hat. Uh, I've got a question about both Russian influence in the election and the president's recent allegation that there may be Chinese influence in the election. What's your view about that? Well, clearly it's, it's clear that there's Russian influence in the election and, and all of America, Democrats and Republicans, should be very, very concerned about that, period. Um, now, now, in terms of the Chinese, um, they're just retaliating on the Trump tariffs. And most of the exports from the United States to China are agricultural. So that's the only way they could, that's the only place they can really go um, and they can impose these tariffs on agricultural goods knowing that they also have substitutes that they can get from other countries. I mean, they don't have to buy American soybeans. They can get soybeans from Brazil, which actually, and there's a, a surplus of soybeans in, in Latin America. Uh, they, they, they can um, um, get so many other commodities from uh, pork from other countries. Uh, they don't have to buy U.S. pork. And so, unfortunately, uh, it is uh, the Chinese retaliatory tariffs are pr primarily aimed at agriculture, which coincidentally happens to be uh, Trump's uh, base supporters. I don't think it's really by design, uh, because there are se several you know, agricultural areas that are also democratic, uh, especially in California, and it's hurting the California economy. But nonetheless, uh, agriculture is an easy place for the Chinese to seek retaliation on our tariffs on Chinese goods. But from what I heard Trump say, he seemed to think that there was some kind of nefarious influence that the Chinese were exercising on the 2018 elections. Do you see that at all? Well, he's talking about uh, the, the concern about uh, uh, American and including Washington state farmers over the tariffs on, on their exports of agricultural goods. And so, um, um, you know, but it was Trump who started these tariffs first. And had it not been for these tariffs, there would not have been counter tariffs, and there would there would not have been an issue for 2018. The Russians sought to manipulate our elections by 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 engaging in a massive intelligence and propaganda effort against us. The Chinese have sought to respond in kind to a, an economic trade war that Donald Trump has launched in his in his effort to win the 
you know, world Olympic champion of stupid economic policies because trade wars are easy to win. Russia was absolutely dedicated to exploiting and, and, and corrupting our democracy. China is fighting back on the trade front in a way that is what nation states do in, the, in a spectrum of diplomatic activities you know, that are to the left of the boom, as they say. It's not where you're shooting at each other, and it's not where you're using a, a massive intelligence and propaganda program to try to subvert American democracy. Um, Governor Locke, is it a mistake or a plus for the Democratic Party to move to the left for, the, for 2018 or 2020? Well, I think they're really trying to address the issues that they think uh, resonate with, with, with first their base and with middle America. Healthcare, pre-existing conditions, climate change. I think a lot of these issues are, are of concern to the American people of varying degrees. And so, um, but I think that at the same time, um, we shouldn't, Democrats need to be very careful that they don't vilify some of their centrist candidates uh, who come from very different populations. I mean, not everybody in Washington state that's a Democrat comes from Seattle. And so you, you, Democrats have to be a little bit more forgiving of their candidates and understand that it's a spectrum. Uh, and to uh, require complete adherence to the far left or to the very, very progressive agenda is actually gonna kill us. Because if we start you know, refusing to endorse our own candidates because they're not pure enough, we're not going to ever win elections, and we're going to have the Republicans and Trump in power forever. And so the question is, are we willing to you know, um, uh, uh, bide our time, look for a little bit more gradual uh, uh, progress in, in a whole host, of whole, whole host of issues, or are we going to say it's all or nothing? Because if we take that all or nothing approach, we're going to get nothing. I think political mo <laughs> It's an outstanding point, Governor. That's an outstanding point. I think political monocultures are always dangerous, and and political uh, ideological tests are always dangerous. I mean, this map up here, Ocasio-Cortez scales to about 20 districts on that whole map, 20 non-African American districts in the whole country where you can get an Ocasio-Cortez elected. Connor Lamb in Pennsylvania is significantly to the right of Ocasio-Cortez, there's about 100 districts up there out of 435 where you can go and compete as a Democrat. So, you know, you've got to ask yourself, do I want the 80% guy who can compete almost everywhere, or do I want the 100% guy who can compete almost nowhere? And Republicans have that same thing. Look, I helped elect Rudy Giuliani in New York before he was, well, before he was Donald Trump's crazy person, um, <laughs> and before he was America's mayor and the hero of 9-11, all that stuff. And guess what? I had Republicans who were saying things like, I can't believe you're working for that guy. He's pro-choice. Well, what do you want me to do? It's freaking New York. I mean, come on, people. I helped elect a Republican governor four times in Vermont. You know how he did it? He wasn't ideologically pure. And I had people like evangelicals who would say, I can't believe you're working for a guy who's not absolutely against gay marriage. Well, we are. It's too bad. It works for him. He's right on the issue. Here we go. So if you want to win, you can't always check off every single box and, and live, like I said, ideological monocultures are politically deadly. They make you stupid and they make you ineffective. So in your book, you are very critical of the president. So my first question for you is, do you have any future at all in the Republican Party? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what At is some point, and it may be a smaller party, it may be a broken party, um, the fever will break. And I think that I think there are two major forces in American politics right now that are driving changes in the in the in, in both parties. The Democratic Party is feeling a very strong fracture between the super progressive part of it and the part that wins elections. Because Bill Clinton, for all his faults, won two national elections. Walking away, second time. And Barack Obama, who, unlike what Republicans said he was the Kenyan progressive secret communist sleeper agent Muslim Sharia law candidate, <laughs> turned out to be a pretty moderate technocratic Democrat. And he won two elections, walking away. And so the Democratic Party is feeling that pressure, and the Republican Party is feeling the pressure between people like me who believe in the rule of law and the Constitution 
and an adherence to economic principles of free markets and individual liberty, and raging nationalist populists who you know want to show up with tiki torches and white polo shirts and have special nighttime ceremonies where African Americans are told where they need to go. Uh, I don't believe in that party. I think that party is going to die. I think that part of that party is is in a demographic and ideological dead end, and it's evil. And frankly, I argue in the book it must be destroyed. Um, but I think there's going to be a future in the, where, where, where people who believe in limited government and individual liberty and rule of law and adherence to the Constitution and, and economic and fiscal discipline will have a voice in our politics again. It's not going to be for a while yet. So there, in the future, sometime, this, this guy should change my question to be, when will we see um, Republicans on the ballot who are more like John McCain, the Bushes, Romney? Any I'm going to say something's going to be in trouble. You guys ready? Wait, the rest of the stuff you said is not going to get you in trouble? <laughs> oh, hell, I'm pretty far down in the ditch on that side. <laughs> I'm going to give you the answer. It's going to shock people, and I'm, I guarantee you, they're gonna, I guarantee you there's going to be a Breitbart story when I say this. Republican politics will change when Rupert Murdoch dies. Because Fox News is the single source of normative behaviors now in the Republican Party. It is the one thing that causes the coherence effect inside the GOP in its post-ideological structure. And that, that situation at Fox where they have been able to monetize this nationalism and this nationalist Trumpist populism is enormously impressive. And Rupert loves to make money and he's really, really good at TV. I mean, the genius of Rupert Murdoch and Roger Ailes is that they figured out there was an underserved audience then they, a starved audience, an audience of conservatives who were desperate, desperate for anything that wasn't the traditional, you know, mainstream media perspective. Well, that starved audience, that, that emaciated audience is now gigantically fat and sitting on its barca lounger shoving cheese doodles down its throat every day. And they're feeding them the same thing that they, 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 they indulge them every single day. And so... Until Fox's programming model changes or its audience ages out, which it's, you know, when Fox kicked off in, in 1997, its audience was 45. In 2007, its audience was 55. Now it's 65. The audience is not expanding, it's just growing older. Um, and it's a big audience, 90 million households. Do not underestimate the power of Fox to, have the, to, to control and shape the behavior of the GOP. And every day, what do they do? Donald Trump is king. Donald Trump is love. Donald Trump is the cult leader, the god, the son. So all those things, that's when the Republican Party will change is when Rupert Murdoch passes and, the, and, and, and Fox looks at its business model and says, can we sustain this after this audience dies out? Governor Luck, um, many Democrats have been outraged by Trump. And um, do you think that the candidates have focused too much uh, of their outrage on Trump rather than making maybe a strong case to winning a vital constituency which they've been losing, which is the white working class? Uh, I've, I actually went into Olympia a few years before the 2016 election and I said to the House Democrats, I said, you guys are in for a rude awakening. You're passing all these bills on climate change and labor issues, labor union issues. Uh, whether state employees or healthcare workers, homeless, mental illness issues, and, and things. And I said, hey, don't get me wrong, I would vote 100% on all of those issues as well. But what are you doing for working blue collar families? What are you doing for working blue collar families who, while mental illness is really in everyone's family, and homelessness is just a, a, you know, a sickness or a job loss away from, from people also being homeless, for most people, whether it's in Aberdeen or Grays Harbor or Centralia or Bellingham, they don't identify those as the most important issues. And that's why I said that um, they need to really focus on the issues, the angst, the concerns, the worries of those blue collar workers. Um, and rude awakening, uh, Trump, a Republican, won for the first time uh, since FDR since Franklin Roosevelt in, on the uh, Pacific or, or Grays Harbor area. Uh, you look at the map in the state of Washington, it's becoming much more Republican, even in traditional Democratic blue-collar areas like Pierce County and Tacoma. Uh, and um, um, Democratic 
statewide candidates have only been winning in just a few counties out of the 39 in the state of Washington. And that's actually beginning to happen throughout the West Coast. I think it was right after, uh, um, what was it, 2005, 2000, 2008 election uh, in which uh, Jay Inslee won uh, governor's race. They were talking about the number of counties that he carried, but also all the other Democrats statewide up and down the West Coast. And it's becoming more and more just the urban areas. Uh, that's a recipe for disaster for the Democrats. And it says that blue collar families who obviously have these other issues that they, they should be aware of and, and how all these issues, whether it's climate change or mental illness and homelessness also affect them and labor rights also affects them but they don't see that direct connection. And that's why I think Democrats have to not just criticize Trump. It's not enough just to criticize the, the president. You have to give people a reason, a motivating buy-in to vote for the Democratic candidate. It's not enough just to criticize. And, and I don't see from the Democratic candidates nationally a, an agenda of what the Democrats really stand for. I've got a somewhat related question for you, Rick. Sure. Um, in my study of politics as a professor, and even before I was a professor, I've always been amazed by how Republicans have outdueled Democrats in terms of identity politics. Um, do you agree? Uh, There's a dirty little secret, and it harks back to what the governor just said, was an awful lot of the time, Democratic candidates do not come across as the guy you want to have a beer with. Now, if you look at a George H.W. Bush, patrician, preppy, New Englander, he came across as a guy who was more likable and approachable than Mike Dukakis. Because you know that Mike Dukakis could talk to you about the actuarial tables of the Massachusetts Retirement Fund until your eyes glazed over, but George W. Bush would, H. W. Bush would talk about baseball. And very frequently when Republican candidates have done well, it's because they are, more, they are more personally engaging. I mean, you guys may think George W. Bush had a lot of faults. I'm sure y'all are big fans around here. <laughs> but let me tell you something. George W. Bush, in person, understands people. And you feel like you are with somebody who gets you, likes you, wants to talk to you. With Al Gore, it's like, yeah, we, let's talk about particulate carbon numbers. or so. it, it, just, it came across differently, and that is a, a cue on the identity politics that comes down not about race or gender or ethnicity or any of those other things, but are you a regular person? Do you come across as more of a regular human being? You know, and for all his flaws, George W. Bush comes across as a regular guy who just happened to be you know, the son of a famous guy and who happened to be president. You know, I used but, to sit with uh, George W. Bush as governors at mm -hmm, the governor's yeah. conventions, and at our table, we would be just rolling in laughter, rolling in laughter. And I, obviously, I was campaigning for uh, Vice President Al Gore a lot, and, but on the presidential debates, George W. Bush came off as the guy that, like your next door neighbor. He didn't talk, he didn't speak perfect English. None of us do, yep. all right? So he came across as that average guy. And, and you want to know that the person that you're voting for, you want to have this sense that the person you're voting for understands your worries, your concerns, has kind of the similar background um, and life story that you might have. Now, obviously, George W. Bush did not have that life story, but he had that image. He had that image of just being one of the regular old guys. It's, it's the common touch question that really is. And, and that's where people in this country, the, there's a, as, as many vicissitudes as we have faced as a people in the last couple of years, there was always a sense that there was a broad political balance in the country. And the left never had too much control for too long, and the right never had too much control for too long. But if you look at the guy in most elections, the avuncular friendly guy, Bill Clinton was enormously approachable. He seemed, he seemed like a great person that you would have the proverbial beer with. So that sense of, of connection with ordinary people beats all the identity politics things at the end of the day. So we're gonna to go to audience questions here in a minute. I have one last question before we um, take a little stretch and um, just about voter participation. Uh, Governor Locke, 
How do you explain to young people, millennials, disaffected voters, how much every vote counts? And I will use the example of the special election back in March, you alluded to it as well, uh, in Pennsylvania 18, where the Democrat that he was describing as sort of an ideal Democrat who could win in a lot of places, um, Connor Land won by 755 votes. You know, how to convey to folks that every vote really does count. It's All we have to do is talk about the Dino Rossi, uh, uh, Christine Gregoire race uh, in 2004, in which um, she won by basically 150 votes. 150 votes out of millions and millions cast statewide. I mean, that really says every vote counts. And then, of course, there are always those stories in which it ends up being a tie and they end up flipping a coin. So, um, you know, um, I, just, I just say that uh, to folks, if you really care about these issues, if you really care, whether it's climate change or homelessness or student debt, um, or the deficit or pre-existing conditions or just moral authority, moral authority, um, uh, an example for our kids uh, to look up to and to, to follow in terms of conducting their own lives, you got to vote. And if you don't, you have no, no excuse. You, you don't, um, you, you know, you, can't, you have no right to be complaining about the results afterwards. Yep. And as a Florida guy, I can tell you, we, we're pretty experienced with close elections where <laughs> vote, vote, every vote counts. Um, and, you know, there's no excuse. As the governor said, he's absolutely right. You know, people tell us in surveys all the time, oh, I'm absolutely going to vote. You know what that absolute number turns out to be? In big elections, somewhere at 60%. But they tell us, 95% of the people say, oh, I'm absolutely going to vote, positively going to vote. And that's where we always chase absentee ballots and voters, try to identify which of those voters are lying to us and which of them are actually going to go out and do it. And, and people who don't understand that the elections, there's only two things you'll never get back in an election, okay? You will never get back a single day and you will never get back a voter you didn't turn out on election day. If you didn't do it, it's done, it doesn't matter. So pushing your friends to vote, pushing your, your, your coworkers to vote, you know, doing all the things, beating the drum. If you wanna win these elections, you gotta go out and kick people in the tail. So let's take a stretch. We, um, these questions are from this students This is from uh, uh, Dr. Rashmi Chordia's class, Citizenship and Society, I think we're over there. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so, one of the, the students ask, what is a strategy that you found successful for having a, a productive and respectful conversation regarding political candidates and campaigns with someone of opposite political beliefs in today's political climate? Alcohol. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. <laughs> Okay, I've got another a question um, from that class. I'm not. <laughs> How can students who are already involved get their peers to become more involved in the political process? Governor Locke? I think we've kind of covered that. I mean, uh, the students that want more of their fellow students involved have to, I suppose, talk about what the first group of students really care about and what they're passionate about and why they need to expand uh, to their friends, uh, expand their friends, or expand the group to include their friends to be involved in those similar issues. Obviously, you can't be kind of abstract about it. You gotta make it real, really real, down to earth, uh, and what it means to your own community, your own city, your own school, your own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, now we've got some qu other questions from Rich Knapziger, who's standing right up here uh, telling, helping us with the microphones tonight who, by the way, used to work for Governor Locke. And um, a question from uh, his policy analysis class, and it is, I guess I should direct this towards Rick. He says, once we vote Trump out of office in 2020, how long will it take to turn America around? Well, at some point, the sun will cool, <laughs> uh, and Earth will freeze. Now, um, I suspect that, like a lot of things, um, for a while, I thought it was going to be the morning after Tijuana thing, where you wake up and go, oh, that was a bad idea. And, you know, <laughs> it takes a couple of days to cook all the tequila out of your system. I actually think he's done more lasting damage to our institutions 
um, both political and, and, and in terms of the rule of law in particular. And I think he's infected a lot of our political uh, class. Uh, and frankly, it's on the right and the left with this idea that expedience and, and, and you know, uh, momentary uh, fights are existential, and so it justifies every lie and every tactic. I think that is something that's gonna take a lot longer to cook out of the system. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I don't wanna be flippant about it. I think that may take decades. I think that the, the infection is very serious. Great, okay, now we'll throw it out to our general audience, and we have Catherine up here, and, and also Rich. Uh, Catherine, do you wanna start then, and we'll alternate? Uh, I've, I've been concerned about the treatment of the, the media, the press, by the president and uh, you know our sort of senior politicians. You have Sinclair Broadcasting, who's essentially a propaganda outlet, and then this last week we see the um, cold-blooded murder of a journalist from the Washington Post in Saudi Arabia and sort of a, the cover-up in possibly not being worse than the crime, but pretty awful. And I'm just wondering you know, what your thoughts are about how the media uh, landscape is changing and what the impact of that is going forward from here. I think that the president's behavior and, toward the media has been absolutely one of the most uh, offensive and significant contraventions of not only our founding principles, but of something that should be wired in the DNA of any republic, and that is a free and unintimidated press. Our founders recognized that they were taking their lives in their hands by speaking against a tyrannical British government. Right now, Donald Trump wants the media to shut up. He wants them cowed, intimidated, frightened, and and I think that the, the, the killing of Khashoggi is something that does not disappoint him in the slightest. I think he's perfectly fine with it. I think he's perfectly fine that his allies have taken a step that he would love to be able to do in his heart of hearts. Because I think that these people are, I think these people are motivated by some very dark impulses. And, and while I don't think Donald Trump has a, has a kill list of reporters, I think that if reporters feel intimidated and frightened, he's perfectly content. Okay. Uh, this, this question is uh, geared a little bit more towards Rick. Um, when we find ourselves in places that are hyper-polarized, like you know, Capitol Hill, Seattle on the left, or like in Odessa, Texas on the right, what are your ideas or suggestions for candidates or would-be candidates that are more moderate or centrist to actually have a sticking point and a message there so that they can win. And uh, second part is uh, the bar around the corner makes a hell of a Pimm's Cup, and I'd be happy to buy you one if you're around. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do love me a Pimm's Cup. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that moderate and centrist candidates need to do is be relevant. I mean, don't go in just on the idea of saying, I'm gonna be civil and I'm gonna be nice. I'm, that doesn't sell. You have to go out and be relevant to people. It's like we, we touched on and the governor touched on, is one of the reasons that the, that, the, that the guy who's accessible tends to win is that they're not talking about boutique issues. As important as people in Washington wanna think of things like climate change and social justice, for the average voter, for the regular guy who's turning a wrench over at Boeing, or the regular guy who's you know, getting up in the morning to drive a garbage truck, he's not thinking about that. He's like, he's focused on, how am I gonna get my kids through college? How am I gonna pay my, my rent? How am I gonna pay my electric bill? These things are much more reduced down to fundamentals than people really give it credit for. And personality can overcome a lot of politics, but you gotta have the right policy, and you gotta have something that moves people. And the other part of it is, don't be afraid to go to, the, to a zone that's a different color. Don't be afraid if you're a Democrat to go campaign. In a, I mean, that's why I give Beto a lot of props in Texas. He is out there hustling in very Democratic areas. When I worked for Rudy Giuliani, we used to go and campaign in the, in the most Democratic parts of the Bronx, in part because it was a big you know, uh, we, the, the sign that we, wouldn't gonna, we weren't gonna be intimidated by any political landscape. We were gonna go and talk and get, deliver the message. 
Do we have a question for Gary Locke over here? No, that's okay. We just take the people in order. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. I'd like to listen to Rick, too. <laughs> um, I'm from Bellingham now, but you can probably tell I'm originally from Australia. So, I find, first of all, apologies for Rupert. Um, there's not much. <laughs> but um, one of the... It's interesting to compare and contrast the political situations in the two countries, but um, specifically the gerrymandering issue that really stands out to me as an Australian. But I'd be interested to know um, your opinions of it with regards to where, where that may go and how it could be changed and if there's even an interest. Most states where, where redistricting gets put on the ballot, uh, people will vote for a nonpartisan redistricting system. And I will tell you something about redistricting. Both sides play this game to the hilt. Um, you know, I've got a lot of experience in redistricting uh, of, of, of states like Florida and uh, Vermont and Wisconsin. And I will tell you, in Wisconsin and Florida, I can tell you, the first calls to the Republicans who controlled the process weren't from other Republicans. They were from the African-American candidates who would say, protect my district and I'll vote for the plan. People always do the thing that is absolutely in their personal political interest to preserve the best district they can. So nonpartisan redistricting could really reshape a lot of things. Now, what would that mean in this country? It would mean fewer deep red seats. For Democrats, it would also mean many fewer African-American and minority candidates will be elected to office, a lot fewer. Because right now, those candidates, especially under voting rights act cases, those tend to be compressed African-American districts. In Florida, the African-American districts, the five African-American held seats in Florida, average 62% Democratic and about 57% African American. That math doesn't work in nonpartisan and non, uh, non racially weighted redistricting. So you have fewer conservative seats, fewer liberal seats. You have a lot more seats where a big old mess and in, in, in contention every cycle. So, but redistricting is, is, is the devil's workshop in all from both parties. Except for Washington State. Right. At Washington State, we actually have an independent commission that does it, and I think they do a fairly decent job. They know where the toss-up districts are, and they try to keep some of those um, you know, uh, uh, toss-up districts in place. But if it's a solid Democratic district, they'll try to keep it solid Democratic and solid Republican, but without drawing these boundaries that make absolutely no sense. And that's what, what you see. You think the eighth makes no sense, the drawing of well, it? Well, that's like that, a terrier <laughs> dog, right? That, that was the Shame. one oddball uh, district that we had in order to also make it uh, somewhat competitive and, and evenly balanced. But, you know, when, when you try to preserve some of the districts that you have in the urban Puget Sound area and keeping the parties um, uh, in control of that and, and then allowing a few toss-up uh, districts, then you're going to get some anomalies. But when you have some of these weird, 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 I mean blatantly, blatantly gerrymandered districts in other states that, that um, I mean, it's so embarrassing. And, and I would, yeah. unfortunately, in so many states, it's controlled by the state legislatures. There's and a district in North Carolina where 17 miles of the district runs down a power easement. <laughs> there are no people living there. <laughs> and, and there are states where, where districts are, as, as they used to say, a modern art masterpiece. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm all for putting the artificial intelligence in charge of it and throw the dice, see where, yeah. where it goes. So I, I very much support nonpartisan or a citizens commission doing these things Agreed. and taking it out of the hands of partisan legislators. We've had that for some time here. For, we have had yeah. it for uh, at least 30 years. And that's why it's so important to also be concerned about who you're voting for in your local legislative races and which party controls. This is for Ambassador Locke. I have always, always, always wanted to donate to your presidential campaign. Is that ever going to be possible? No, that's not possible. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're so yeah. kind. You're so kind. You know, you know, Governor, P. Joe O'Rourke once said that the average American voter equates a denial with a full confession of guilt. <laughs> I think he's running, y'all. Let me, let me just say about running for president, I think it takes a very special person and maybe uh, it takes a person with a lot of chutzpah 
to, to uh, be able to subject himself or herself out there every single day, to be traveling every single day, raising god-awful amounts of money and being rejected. And, and uh, just running for state legislator and then running for county executive and running for governor was hard enough as it was, trying to raise money, even asking for a $100 donation and being rejected. Or, or you know, you, 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 you ask... $500 from people who are very, very wealthy and they give you $150 and you know they can afford more. And then you have an elderly retired person who gives you $300 and you feel guilty taking that $300 or $100 from a very low income or retiree and saying, oh my gosh, no, no, why don't you take that back? But you, know, you don't want to offend them either. So it's, it's really hard. Uh, that's the worst part, I think, of campaigning is the fundraising, the fundraising. Anytime a candidate asks me, you know, What's the hardest thing I'm going to do? I will tell them, the hardest thing you're going to do is get on the phone every day for 300 days and call strangers and say, give me $5,000. 2500 from you, 2500 from your wife. Give me this money. Give it to me. Give me that money. Where's that check? <laughs> give me that grip. I want it. Give it to me. It's so hard. It's so miserable. It's so humiliating. It's like, I mean, I would, ra it, it, you know, people joke with me, Rick, you should run for office. Absolutely not. I would sooner put a drill through my foot than call people every day and say, can I have $1,000? Can I have $5,000? It's, it's utter misery. And, and that's, I mean, if you're going to run for president against Donald Trump, you're a Democrat, you got to raise $300 million at the minimum. That's the low boundary of what you can raise. That math is really hard. And you got to hopefully be a decent candidate at the same time. Because Hillary was great at raising money, but her ROI was terrible because she was, you know, uh, she, was, she was an indifferent candidate in terms of connecting with people. Great at raising money. Raised a gazillion dollars. But a Democrat running against Trump needs to be able to raise $300 million, and that is the low end of the spectrum. So Ronald Reagan said the most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. So why do Republicans run for government if it's the worst thing on earth? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> well, in the old days, there was this theory that we were going to get the government into the bathtub and drown it. That's a Grover Norquist special. Um, and, that, and that the idea that the state needed to be restrained and controlled and that the only way you can do it inside of a constitutional system is by seeking elected office and passing legislation to reduce the size and scope of government. Now, all that went right out the window in 2016 because Donald Trump has expanded the power of government, expanded the power of the state, because it's catching the Mexicans. And that's what, he wa that's what his people love. They love, they, you know, the, the, the former theory that we're gonna shrink the size of government and the power of the, of the, of the wicked bureaucratic state goes right out the window when it's, you know, let's hire 100,000 more ICE agents. Those things, are, you know, display a certain contradiction inside the current iteration of the GOP. Um, but, you know, the, the idea was always, you know, you could reduce the power of the state two ways. You can be elected, pass laws that control the bureaucracy and the power of government, or you could, you know, have a revolution from the outside. The latter is so messy and causes so many problems that, you know, you want to actually run for office and do it inside the system. So we saw President Trump this evening declare himself a nationalist. Oh, did we? Yes, in Houston at the Trump, at the Cruz rally. And but this isn't this isn't the only place we see nationalism rising. We see it in Brazil. We even see signs of it like with Ford in Canada, and sure. we certainly see it in Europe. Uh, do I, both? And this is a question for both of you. Do you see? Uh, Trump as an example of America catching a bit of the populism nationalism flu that seems to be going around or do you see this as part of a more fundamental realignment where the Republican is, par party will eventually emerge as a populist nationalist party and the Democratic Party becoming more of a cosmopolitan globalist party? I always hesitate when we use the phrase cosmopolitan. That has some historical antecedents I'm not really comfortable with. Um, but I will say this. Nationalism as a political tool is like a chainsaw. Chainsaws are great. I love chainsaws. I break them a lot, but I love them. 
But that very powerful tool in the wrong hands gets out of control very quickly. And a lot of the nationalist movements that are emerging in the world are very thinly veiled authoritarian movements. And nationalism is a tool of authoritarianism and statism. And as an actual conservative, not one of the Trump era conservatives, I've seen the historical precedents for nationalism quickly and terribly going off the rails. And I think that, that the nationalists that come out as a work, just with a work in man, this is a song we've heard before in the last century a number of times. It ends badly. It ends in camps. It ends in death. It ends in oppression. And, and so while these things may, may rise as a political force because of their utility, I think that, that the arc of history is already too far uh, you know, advanced for it to be unresisted. And I think it's vital for people to resist the power of authoritarian statism with all their might. And it's one of the reasons that I oppose Donald Trump because I'm not, I'm, I'm, look, Trump as a man, as a person, he's a clown. He's a joke. Um, but Trump as a symbol, manipulated by Steve Bannon and, and the Stephen Millers of this world, um, you know, Adolf Hitler was, was now I, I, I hesitate to make a comparison between Trump and Adolf Hitler because Hitler had normal sized hands. But authoritarian leaders in the past have always had a bunch of smart guys around them who understood how to exploit their charisma. And so Goering and Goebbels and Himmler understood how to play Hitler's charisma. And Bannon and Miller and the, and the rest of, the, of, of the, the smarter set around Trump understand how to play his charisma. It is a dangerous tool. And again, like I said, I think all people of goodwill, regardless of party, have an obligation to reject authoritarian statism in all its forms, and Trump is certainly the latest iteration of that. Obviously, there are forms of nationalism, and there's the simple nationalism of just having pride in your country and your community. Sure. Uh, but as, as Rick was saying, I mean, there's the very dangerous element and, and extreme of nationalism, which really is authoritarianism. And I see that really, that's the thing that troubles me most about Trump and how he's giving voice to that and encouraging that and expanding that. And in some ways, he's applauding other authoritarian nationalist leaders, whether it's in Europe or in the Philippines and elsewhere around the world. And he loves these strongman rulers. He loves those strongman rulers, whether even even if it's the head of Turkey, all right, uh, and um, and he, he gravitates toward that. I think it's because of he wants a lot of that power himself. As as Rick was saying, he lo he probably doesn't care what happened to uh, to the journalist uh, that was killed in um, in the consulate or in the embassy in in Istanbul uh, because of his loathing Trump's loathing of the press. Um, but I I, I very. I'm very concerned about this growing nationalism as, as we see it, or authoritarianism in America, this scapegoating of ethnic minorities and, and other groups, and income groups, and, and political groups, and the media. It's, it's a danger that we saw during World War II or leading up to World War II and Hitler. And it's a, we're seeing that playing out throughout Europe, and, and I hope that we're not having a repeat of some of the dark ages of, of the 1940s playing out in Europe. And let me just say that for me, um, I think the strength of America is our diversity. I mean, we are a land of foreigners, except for the Native Americans, we're all foreigners. Uh, whether our ancestors came on the Mayflower, on a slave ship, or on a vessel from China. And it's that wave after wave of foreigners, immigrants, that with new ideas, new cultures, new values, uh, new, you know, just a drive and energy that has really propelled America and led to our innovation and our greatness as a country. Um, and so for Trump to deny our legacy and so many people in the Congress and the Republican Party to deny the essence of America, I keep saying they're the ones who don't understand what it truly 
what, it truly, what we truly need to make America great. And, um, I, couldn't, and, I couldn't agree more, Governor. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and one of the things that disturbs me the most about this particular flavor of nationalism that Trump has embraced is that America is a propositional nation. We are not a Volk, as the Germans would say, or a Rodina, as the Russians would say. We are not a race. We are not a single ethnic group in this country. You know what? You show up here, you play by the rules, you become a citizen, you're an American. You are allowed to be from anywhere, from any circumstance, high or low, from any continent, from any background, from any tribe, any religion, doesn't matter. If we don't continue to embrace that as a central pillar of this republic, we are lost. If we think that it's only about white Protestants in this country, we are lost. As the governor said, you know, generation after generation came here, and maybe they were the hated ones in that, in that, in that generation. You know, when, when, when your ancestors came from China or my ancestors came from Germany, there was a period where we were the ones who were like, oh my God, I can't believe those people, they're awful. And right now, those people are, the, are, are walking up here from Central America that in 50 years will be pillars of their communities. And that's because of this propositional nature of the American Republic. And if we, if we lose that, I think we've lost everything. So this question is probably geared more towards Governor Locke, but both of you can jump in. There's obviously a battle going on right now between the Trump Republicans and the more intellectually consistent Republicans. But on the other hand, there is another battle between... There's like six of us, so you can... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, on the other hand, what do you think is going to be the effect of the current and future battle between the moderate uh, Democrats and the Democratic Socialist branch of the Democratic Party? Uh, I, I think they're, they'll sort it out. Um, uh, in, with Rick's question, answer to a, a previous question about what does it take for, a, let's say, a centrist or a moderate to win in Capitol Hill. It's not to, it's, it, each candidate has to reflect the values of their particular community and whether it's the entire state of Washington if they're running statewide or if they're running just in a legislative district or a city council race, just their neighborhoods. Um, but I think that to be successful, the Democrats have to also look beyond. And so for the, the progressives, the, the, the very progressives in Seattle, that's okay to focus on those issues, but don't ignore the other issues that are of concern to other people, whether they're moderate Democrats or just unaffiliated independent voters. We, we, we have a responsibility to look for the, out for our entire society, and while we may have pressing, you know, some of us may have very pressing priorities that, that really fuel our passion, that's great, that's okay. Just don't ignore the other issues that perhaps are more paramount to people uh, within the party or outside the party. We have time for two more questions. Don't forget your microphone. Time for two more questions. <laughs> we'll go fast. All right. Hi, uh, so I'm a junior, and my question is more geared towards climate change. Well, we've been talking a lot about different issues, different partisan issues, and this, uh, I've held this philosophy for the past couple of years that like we can debate partisanship all we want, but if you can't breathe the air, or drink the water, it doesn't really matter. And so given the context of the recent UN climate report, uh, Mr. Wilson, you talked about relevancy a little bit ago. I wanted to know how can we shift the social perception of climate change and its dangers to something that is more relevant? Because I feel like it is just such a back burner issue, even now. I, I'm going to tell you, I, I recognize the importance, but right now, every time I go, in, if I go in the field with a survey anywhere in this country, okay, and I ask for, what we, we do a thing called the MIP, Most Important Problem Panel, okay? We ask that question all the time. We can do it two ways. We can ask people to just give us their random list of what comes to their mind, or we can give them a set of choices. In every single Most Important Problem Panel, you will always see jobs, economy, education, those things are way up there in the double digits. Climate change generally falls somewhere around two to 4%. No one cares, no one gives a damn, no one believes it is gonna be something that they're gonna vote on that day and, and for Democrats to keep trying to ram it down people's throats 
it's led to a certain resistance level to talk about it and engage on it. And so climate change may be a big important issue, but it is not an issue that American voters give a damn about. And it's just a hard fact. It, that's, not, that's not weighing in on saying it's real, not real. I think it's absolutely happening, but you know, voters don't base their behavior at the ballot box on climate change. And there is not yet, given how much has been spent to, to talk about it, there has not yet been a message the Democrats have been able to come across with that's changed the political landscape on climate change as a, as a cutting voting issue. I really think that uh, I'm very worried about climate change. I'm very, very worried, and I see the effects in China. I see it uh, in so many other parts of the world, and I'm seeing it here in the Pacific Northwest in terms of hotter summers and more forest fires, less cold, really severe cold winters that will kill a lot of the beetles that, are, that then uh, are able to infest uh, our, our forests, and you're seeing so many dead trees in the forests of the Pacific Northwest, which then are very, very ripe for forest fires. Um, I agree with Rick, unfortunately, that it, it's not paramount because unfortunately most Americans and most people only focus on the immediacy, what's really staring them in the face. And we procrastinate like crazy. You know, we, in our own individual behaviors, we procrastinate like crazy and we say, okay, yeah, well, we can put that off. There's time to work on that tomorrow or day after tomorrow when there really isn't time according to the UN report. I actually think that Democrats need to start smaller and maybe with student-led initiatives on climate, on environmental issues, because you get the power of students, whether it's high school students with an initiative, whether it's to ban styrofoam and all this kind of plastic in the environment, and then you keep going on. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I just think Democrats need to th rethink their strategy on how to address climate change. And they also need to look at it from a job creation standpoint. Retrofitting, insulation, you know, uh, um, energy efficiency. Those are job creation initiatives. So think of it from the standpoint of what is it that most people are concerned about in families, whether it's in Grays Harbor or Bellingham, they want jobs. Okay, then make it, tie that to climate change. Okay, this question is directed more towards Rick. So I identify center-right, moderate Republican like yourself. Mm -hmm. I supported Kasich in the primary. There was about four of us. Sure, it was yeah. a fun time, but didn't go anywhere. Um, what do you recommend for someone like me who sits here, and I think you do the same thing, and you're like, okay, we have jokers on the left, jokers on the right. Who do I vote for when I want to you know, still participate and do my civic duty? you got to stay involved with candidates that you believe in. And you don't need to compromise, and they don't have to be perfect for you, but if you step out of the arena completely, then the extremes win. If you, if you, I mean, it's, like, it's why a lot of people badger me, like, why are you a solo Republican? If I quit the party, I lose my standing to put out my middle finger and say to my co-party members, hey, you're being a bunch of jackasses. They'll just say, oh, he got disgruntled and left. So leaving the arena is always a loss. Stay in the fight. Find people you can support. It may be harder. It may be more difficult. Try to persuade people that you are working with that, you know, that the traditional path of limited government conservatism, of optimistic conservatism that isn't dark and exclusionary is, 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 a, is a, a, a winner across the, the, the broad spectrum and, not, and that Trumpism doesn't reflect everything that you believe in. So should, should he and other Republicans uh, help dem elect Democrats the way that Kristoff was saying in the column today in the New York Times to tear down the Republican Party immediately so that the Republican Party can rebuild? I think they've got a case by case that because look, I, I, I will tell you, if I, was, if I was in Devin Nunez's district, I'd sure as hell vote for the Democrat, okay? <laughs> because Devin Nunez is essentially committing obstruction and treason trying to protect this president. Um, but, look, if, you, if you've got a guy like Dino Rossi, who, by the way, in the, in the spectrum of Trumpist Republicans, Dino Rossi's basically Ted Kennedy. <laughs> um, maybe more like Bernie Sanders, even. Uh, but, you know, you've got to find people you can work with, and you've got to, and, you know, we, if you're a volunteer at your level, you're playing smaller ball than trying to do a massive sort of national realignment of ensuring that you have accountability in Congress. So, 
You know, if you find a Democrat, look, there are some Democrats this year running for office. I'll give you an example. In uh, North Carolina 9, Dan McCready is a Democrat, former Marine Corps officer, combat veteran. He's to the right of his Republican opponent on trade, deficits, and, and, and the budget. It's crazy time. I mean, you look at that and you're like, what the heck, how's that happening? So it's something to, to, to look at. You know, there's a case-by-case basis. You can make decisions where, and look, I've worked against two Republicans in my 30 years career in politics. One of them was Donald Trump. Pretty proud of that. The other was against Roy Moore. <laughs> and let me tell you something. I will never lose a single night of sleep for big, making some of the, the, the negative TV ads that I'm infamous for against a child molesting creepy scumbag. Sometimes the moral test is that bright, sometimes a little more difficult. Good luck, stay in the fight. We were gonna make that the last question, but we noticed well, you we'll had- We'll take a, the four, we'll take those four. She had uh, Rick's book in your hand there. So. Right, we'll uh, take actually, the my question is for Governor Locke. We'll take the four. Um, I would like to talk to Rick though. Um, you, you mentioned well, Rick, about, Rick's happy if you bought the book, so yeah, that's all exactly. he cares about. Uh, you mentioned about you know, the, the purity test, but how do you enforce some kind of ideological rigor in the Democratic Party? And I'm thinking of you know, Joe Lieberman, who spent pretty much the last four years of his terms just stabbing President Obama and the Democrats in the back, you know, on ACA, on the stimulus package, or Joe Manchin in West Virginia, who you could say, okay, he's not with the Democrats on the climate issues, but that's because coal mining is an industry, that's a local issue. But, you know, he just turned around and stabbed the Democrats in the back on Brett Kavanaugh, and, you know, looks like a total chump now because Trump came out and mocked him for voting, or Donald Trump Jr. came out and mocked him for voting for Kavanaugh. You know, what, do you, what, do you, you know, what can you do to kind of, you don't want to be too pure, but, you know, even in Washington State, I remember, you know, looking at what Lieberman did and being really angry at this guy and kind of wishing that President Obama had some more of the killer instincts that Lyndon Baines Johnson had, who would have really dropped the hammer. You know, if you've ever read Caro's books, you know, I mean, Joe Lieberman would have been in a world of hurt if he'd tried that stuff. So, I mean, it's a hard thing, but, you know, how can you, you know, because I think it frustrates a lot of Democrats to see, you know, somebody like President Obama come along, and I, you know, canvass for President Obama, and then you see somebody else who's supposedly in his party just, you know, okay. And what's your, what's your question? Right. And, you know, how, do you, what, how do you draw that line? You know, like, well, where, do you, where do you like to say, okay, you've gone beyond the pale? Like, I think Joe Manchin's gone beyond the pale with this Kavanaugh thing. I can't believe, okay. Okay. you know. Well, yeah. if, if, I, if I care about the future appointments of the United States Supreme Court and a rule of law, then I, I guess I would still support Manchin holding my breath because I really want to make sure that we have a check on the judicial appointments, lifetime appointments that Trump will be making. Um, and it's really up to whether it's President Obama to decide whether or not he can still tolerate and, and sit down with Joe Lieberman despite all the darts that Lieberman may have made and the votes that he may have cast against uh, Obama's policies. But you're, that's going to be an individual choice, and, and you need, as, as Rick was saying, you need to decide on the candidates that you favor and that you can work with, and it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. The party as a, as a nation sometimes may have to, uh, you know, um, make some adjustments and, and be more accommodating in order to get part of their, their, their overall agenda uh, through. But let me just say one thing. you got to have... You have to have values, and you got to stand by your principles. And I guess what's really disconcerting with some of the Republicans like Ted Cruz is for Trump to have attacked Ted Cruz the way he did, to attack his wife, his to attack his father, and then for Ted Cruz then to suddenly turn around and say, I love the man, and I'm going to support you because I need to get reelected. Um, I, I think that's going too far. I mean, you have to have personal honor. And, and I, I think that's most important, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you have to have personal honor. And I, I'm dismayed at the lack of personal okay. honor that many of our office holders have, especially in fulfilling their constitutional responsibility to be an independent branch of government. I'm gonna wrap it up right there. That was such a good discussion. So many great questions. We thank you all for coming. That was a inadvertent mic drop there on my part. And um, the book table's outside. Thank you both so, so, so much. much. What a wonderful, Thanks, what a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.